Hello, everyone. Welcome to Blogger Todd Live. So I'm your host, Mark Rosewater. So I'm the head designer for Magic, uh, and Kaladesh is my 20th lead. So I'm very excited to be here. And I have a special guest. So this is Ethan Fleischer. So Ethan um, won the second great designer search. He was the lead designer of Journey to Nyx, Commander 2014, Oath of the Gatewatch, uh, the upcoming Commander 2016, and Ethan and I together are co-leading Amonkhet next, next spring. So welcome, Ethan. Hello, thanks for having me. Okay, for, the, for those that are unaware, um, Blogatog is the name of my blog. It's on Tumblr. Every single day you can come and you can ask me questions. Uh, I've had the blog for five years, and I think I've answered something like 80,000 questions. So we are trying to capture the flavor of that and bring it here live today so that you guys can ask us questions. Uh, and we're going to answer all sorts of fun questions for you. But before we begin, um, I did a Blogger Talk Live earlier this summer at San Diego Comic Con. And as a special for my two Blogger Talk Lives, I made a little comedy film that no one has seen other than the audience at this year's Comic Con. It hasn't been online or anything. So I'm going to now introduce you to a little comedy film I made that I want to say was uh, directed, shot, and edited by my oldest daughter, Rachel. I'm pulling my driveway. We all know what that means. It's time for another drive to work. I got to go pick up Sarah from her friend's house. You all know what that means. I have to get Adam from school. You know what that means. I'm uh, going out for a drive. We all know what that means. I'm getting my mail. You know what that means. I'm taking out the garbage. You know what that means. It's time to do the laundry. You know what that means. It's time to eat dinner. It's time for me to go shopping. I'm grilling hamburgers. It's time to buy bagels. I'm reading to my son at night. We're at swimming lessons. I'm ready to make copies. It's time to buy some food. I'm helping my daughter with homework. I'm going to work out. I'm brushing my teeth. I'm relaxing at the beach. It's time for bath. I'm getting my hair cut. I'm at the water park. I'm teaching Rachel to drive. I'm trying to go to bed. We all know what that means. It means be quiet and go to sleep. Today I'm going to talk about how to build a pool of cards. Okay. One of the hardest things about designing a set is knowing what to cut. The washer is kind of like design. It's the start of the process. Some items just aren't for you. The ham one never has one or another. So you know who was a real ham? Tom Gavin. He came in second at the second Pro Tour. Oh, he was fun to put in feature matches. Oh, I got a better story than this book. Okay, so we were trying to design Invasion, but we only had a week. So when you're teaching someone how to play, it's really important. Um, Dad, are you even watching? Oh, good point, Rachel. It's very important that you watch what they do. Have I got a story about Ice Age? And I think development is kind of like the dryer. Bill, Bill, Bill. That reminds me, a lot of Bills have worked on magic. We have Bill Rose, the VP of R&D. Once you've made your mechanic, then you gotta test it. There's Bill McQuillan, who's edited for Magic. The right reprints can make a set even better. There's Bill Stark, who works behind the scenes doing a lot of programs. Creature Pump is a very important part of green. We have William Jockish, who, well, not technically a Bill, but pretty close. Ham. That's the code name for the 2017 fall set. I'm not supposed to talk about it, but... Okay, let me tell you all about it. So a lot of designs require me to bring work home. I mean, it, it's not like we stop thinking about magic when we leave the office. Dad. Uh, 4x minus 5. Uh, so really, every... Ah, fire. Uh, that was the code name for Saviors of Kamigawa. Ugh, that set had some problems. Trying to design a magic set is a lot like trying to fall asleep. Go to sleep. In the spirit of bagels, instead of a top 10, I thought I would do a top 12. Oh, wait, top 13, baker's dozen. Uh, can you watch the headset, please? And at some point, you want to take your file and just relax. But other than Bill and Richard, nobody wanted to. So this is Black Forest ham. Black Forest. Okay, let me talk about Golgari. You have to have a plan. 
You, you can't just put everything in your cart, just like you can't just put everything in your set. Taking no risk is the biggest risk of all. That's why every time I'm doing that, I always want to... Most designers think about clothes, but the good designers also think about the hangers. In my 20 years at Wizards, I've gotten in a lot of uh, hot water. And that long story is why you always want to shop for the right mechanic. Mark, why don't you sit down? We need to talk to you. Is this an intervention? Well, you know what that means. Maybe I should talk about how we, <laughs> how we turn a white card into a black card. <laughs> Okay. Okay, guys, now it's time for us to answer your questions. So if anything you want to know, there's a mic you guys can line up, and you can ask us anything you want, and Ethan and I are going to answer the questions for you. So what do you want to know about magic? Obviously, we just introduced Kaladesh. I'm happy to answer questions about Kaladesh or anything about magic you want to ask. Yeah, it's okay. So I've been a fan of the blog since it was Tales from the Pit in yes, the okay. really early years. Old school, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my biggest question about Kaladesh is why you designed cards to both create and consume energy versus energy providers and energy consumers. Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So the question is, why do most cards produce and use energy? Why didn't we just make some cards that made energy and some cards that use energy? Uh, and the answer is, um, we did a mechanics panel earlier on the weekend, and we did pros and cons of the mechanics. And one of the big cons of energy was its parasitism, that you really have to use energy to be able to have it, and that we wanted to make sure that cards could stand on their own. So if you have a card that both provides energy and uses energy, well, you could just play that card by itself. Uh, it's a lot like serrated arrows I talked about was the inspiration. So it's a lot like a card with charge counters. Oh, I have so many charge counters, I can use it so many times. So by both providing and getting energy, it allows you, the card can be self-sufficient. Um, we did end up making a few cards that give you energy without using it. Um, I don't even think there's any cards that use energy without getting it. So the reason was it was less parasitic if we did it that way, and it just made better gameplay. Also, that's, energy is kind of an A plus B mechanic, right? You, you get energy and then you spend it. And that can be really hard when you're actually playing the game of Magic, right? If you draw your cards in the wrong order, then nothing works and you have a frustrating experience. Okay, Hi. next question. I was just curious, uh, why did you re not reprint, but print the new Fastlands as opposed to like another uh, Painland or something of that oh, sort? Why did we print the Fastlands? So first off, um, design has very little input into actually what lands we do. The development team run by Eric Lauer because the lands are so crucial to how constructed works, that's something that development will do. Um, we're in a weird situation right now where for a long time we favored the ally combinations over the enemy, and finally we said, you know, we want them to kind of be treated equal, but there's a lot of cycles where we've made the ally and haven't made the enemy, so we are trying to play catch up, and we had made the ally lands long ago, players really wanted to finish the larger cycle, and I mean, I'm not sure exactly why Eric put them up here. There, there's a lot of reasoning, but it's not, I didn't do it, so I don't know all the reasons behind it. But I do know that people have been asking for us to finish off the cycle for a long time. So a lot of people are really happy that we finally sort of made the enemy versions. Me, I'm one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Uh, I have some questions, but uh, they're not my questions. They right. actually came from, uh, from Twitter. So I have at Swedebit asking, my daughter would like to know what your favorite part of designing vehicles was. Thanks. OK, so what was my favorite part about designing vehicles? Well, wh so one of the things, I explained this in the mechanics panel, vehicles have been something the audience has been asking for for years. I mean, years and years and years. And we always sort of like, it was one of those challenges that I kept pushing off because it, it's a hard thing to do. But once we got here and we saw the world was just filled with vehicles, we said, okay, let's figure out how to make it work. My favorite part was we made a lot of, we did a lot of top-down vehicles as a way to inspire. So we made like ice cream truck and tank and hot air balloon. And we just came up with a lot of fun things that we sort of built around. 
those flavor didn't stay, but it really jogged our memory. Like, what would an ambulance do? Did you, did you have any? I did. Um, so I remember I tried to submit a vehicle mechanic for Theros block, actually. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have uh, you know, ships landing like in uh, the Iliad and soldiers coming out, and you were like, no, 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 hold off. We gotta, we gotta save this new artifact <laughs> mechanic for an artifact block. And I was like, all right, I, th I guess that makes sense. Um, and I was on a vehicles mini team. We made all kinds of crazy stuff. We made trains with different cars that connect together, <laughs> and I, I made a sports car that costs a lot of mana and had all of the keywords. Um, and some of that stuff made it through, and uh, some of it didn't. But it was super fun to work on vehicles just because it was this completely unexplored space for us creatively. Yeah, they, they have a lot of flavor, so they're, they're extra fun to design because there's so much flavor. Okay, next question. I'm actually going to take one from our spell slingers line okay. over here. So oh, just over there, a sorry. I didn't, know there, I didn't know there was a line over there. Okay. Well, they made me pick one line or the other. So uh, um, I try to do custom design work, and mm -hmm. I find myself always getting trapped designing like Onslaught because that was my first set. Mm -hmm. What do you have for advice to bust out of those, like the familiar zone of... Uh, okay, so, what, so what, for amateur designers, how can you help design a little different than how you've done? So the trick I recommend is using something, some randomizer that forces you to go someplace you don't normally go. So for example, just say I'm stuck one day, I will just do something like, let me come up with a random donut what is what does a bear claw? How can that inspire me? You know, I I will come up with something that's unlike anything I've ever done, just to get my brain in a different place. And so I would like to start all designs from a place I've never started before. And so, for example, Kaladesh was neat because it's like I never made a steampunk set before. I've never, you know, this was an inventor world. I just, we started from this whole idea of optimism, be like an inventor, and that was so different that we just made different kinds of things. So really what I would say is, if you want to try, if you want to push your brain to different places, force yourself to just start someplace you've never started before. What's your advice? I, I totally agree with that. Starting with one thing and just building off of it is great. I think starting from different places, like sometimes you're naturally going to start from a top-down concept. I want to depict this kind of story or something. And sometimes you can start from a purely mechanical conceit. I want to I explore this zone change or something, right? Like, what does this mean? Um, so there's lots of different starting points that will help you to not fall into the same pattern every time. OK. Well, Okay, next question. <laughs> Hi, I play a lot of uh, Kitchen Table Commander, and I was just wondering, mm -hmm. do you have like a set amount of cards for Commander that you put into a normal set? Yeah, oh. it's not. So one of the things about making Magic is, obviously there's a lot of different audiences. I talk all the time about how Magic, in some ways, isn't one game, it's many games with a shared rule system. The goal essentially is, we want to make sure that every player has something they want, but it, we don't allocate, it's not like, oh, this is a Commander card. What we try to do is, whenever we design something, if we think it has applications for a format, we try to go, oh, is there things we can do that might help make this more familiar for a certain audience? But we don't allocate. It's not like there's 15 commander cards. That's not how we design. But we do, for example, whenever we have a card and we're templating, we always say, can this be templated for multiplayer play? You know, is there a way to, instead of saying an opponent, we say all opponents. We'll, we'll ask questions like that to make sure that when we hit something, we can do that. The one place we very specifically think about Commander is when we make legendary things. Now, not all legendary things are made for Commander. There's audiences that enjoy them that aren't Commander players. But because that's so important, we do think about it when we do legendary things. Yeah, I, I do like to, for every set that I'm working on, uh, you know, for a booster release, I try to think about what are the big themes of the set and how can I capture those themes in a build-around card that's legendary to make the set appealing to commander players. Like, oh, I have this, this uh, commander now. What goes good with this? Oh, it's cards from this set that's just coming out. I should, I should open some more <laughs> booster packs. <laughs> okay, next question. I'm wondering if you have anything to say or any trivia that relates to my favorite card, Jelectrode, from the original Ravnica. Uh, remind me what Jelectro did. Um, it's a weird uh, zero one. Mm -hmm. um, its most interesting ability is that it untaps uh, whenever you play an instant or sorcery card. 
Oh, well, so one of the interesting thing is whenever you, we do guild work and stuff, that you take two colors and say, where do they overlap? So red and blue are in a weird space because one of the defining qualities of them is blue has the most spells and red has the second most spells. So when you put them together, they want to be really spell focused. But at the same time, the flavor of is it is taking the overlap between blue and red philosophically, which is about creation and invention. And so there's this weird mix of part of the is it wants to be about inventing things and part of the is it wants to be about caring about spells. And so how do you make kind of Johnny, Jenny friendly cards that both like can care about spells, but you can build around. And that's the kind of card that we make to sort of fill that gap in. All right, great, thank you. Okay. Hi, Mark. At Third Coast MTG wants to know, what was the rolling discussion like for the crew dying or not dying, depending on whether or not a destroyed vehicle occurred? Okay, so the question is all about, right now, if you put creatures in the vehicle and the vehicle gets destroyed in combat, the creatures don't die. The, the vehicle will, will be destroyed, but the creatures aren't. We always, we never ever actually, from the beginning of making the mechanic through the finals, it was always our intent that the creature survived. Why? Um, because we wanted it to be different than equipment. So equipment is like, I have a creature, I take this artifact, I kind of bring them together, and then if something happens in combat, the creature dies and the equipment stays behind. So we actually like turning that on its ear with vehicles. So it's like I take my creature, I combine it with this other artifact thing. If, 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 some, if it dies in combat, oh, unlike equipment, the creature survives and the other thing goes away. So we really like that. Um, the more flavor answer is there's uh, a lot of airbags in, um, in Kaladesh. <laughs> I do feel like from a sort of developmental standpoint, Vehicles were a big challenge because a lot of time you'll be piling multiple creatures into some of the larger vehicles and it, putting all of those cards at risk in one combat is too much to ask for a lot of players. So we really had to do everything we could to avoid disincentivizing people from putting their creatures into the vehicles. Yeah. Okay, who's that? Over here? Okay, next question. All right, so my question was about the new energy mechanic. Um, okay. When I first saw it spoiled, one of my first thoughts was that it was like, just a, something really different that you don't usually see in Magic. Mm -hmm. um, is this, did, was it ever a concern to you that it would change the game too much and like feel like something that wasn't Magic? Well, okay, one of the, whenever we come up with new things, I mean, one of the tensions of Magic is we want Magic to feel like Magic. And so whenever we make something, like our goal is not to change the game so much that you don't recognize it. But in the same sense, it's a living, breathing game. We want to make sure we come up with new things. And so there's a balance we want to get. Um, we did a lot of different versions of, uh, of the energy mechanic. And the reason we chose the current version was because it was kind of the easiest to grok. But like, I collected them, there was one number, just my, my opponent and I just had to watch one number. Like we had versions, for example, where it was like a charge counter version, where like every counter, you know, every artifact that was an energy thing had charge counters on it. And then you can remove a counter from anything that had it. And that was a lot harder to wrap your brain around because it's like, how much energy, let, let me, one, two, three, like, it was hard to remember how much energy you had. Um, and a lot of the design work was trying to make it simple. But it's different. I mean, one of the things about people, when I explain energy to you, you're not going to understand energy until you've played with energy. I mean, the, you can kind of intellectualize it to a certain extent, but it is a different resource. And what that means is, like, you're so used to playing with mana that you kind of forget that when you first started playing with mana, that you had to kind of learn how mana worked. And, and you, over time, you shorthand it. Energy doesn't have any of that shorthand. The first time you play energy, it'll be like, oh, this is just different, you know? And that one of the neat things about it, and one of the things we want to do in Magic is, I want every set to make you comfortable, but also make you play Magic slightly differently. I want you, like, the average person who plays Magic has played nine and a half years. That is longer than the average game lasts. Like, like how, why do people play for so long? Because the game does keep evolving, we keep it interesting, and that, you know, there's a balance. But I think energy fits, like, energy is very flavorful, it makes a lot of sense, and it's not hard to understand what it does, but, you know, it's simple to learn, but it takes a lifetime to master kind of thing. That it has a lot of subtleties in how you use it. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of baseline strategy for mana is if you can spend all of your mana in a turn, you've done it, right? You've done the most powerful thing you can possibly do. But with energy, sometimes the correct play is to save your energy for later until you can build it up and draw the right card that will use it in a different way. Okay, We're here. Okay, next question. Hi guys. Um, Hi. So my <laughs> partner and I love fungi as a tribe, as a tribe, and we were wondering if they were popular enough to come back, especially with the weird spore counter thing that they've done in the past that made them feel really unique, or even just as like a major theme that would be supported sort of normally like other tribes. There are a lot of fans of thalids and sapperlings and assorted other mushroom people, <laughs> and I count myself as one of them. So. There are plenty of uh, people on the inside who are on your team there, I would say. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Magic does really well is there are a lot of creature types that we do. I think there's some that are more meat and potato ones that we do all the time, and there are ones that have flavor that are really fun, but we need the right environment. You, you just can't throw funguses anywhere. But, I mean, there are fans, I, there are fans in R&D and in creative of them, so I, I think you'll see them again. It's just they require the right place to use them. They're not, you, you just can't throw them anywhere. And Kaladesh is not the most fungus of worlds, so. No. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, where's my next question? Hello. Okay. Hello. Uh, so I have a life as a designer question. Okay. Uh, so out of all the games of magic you play nowadays, what mm -hmm. percentage of them do you play with like real magic cards that have art? Sadly, a small, small percentage. <laughs> um, for me personally, I, I'm, uh, we both have families. Uh, I don't have a lot of time outside of work for game playing. My, my family and I have like a Friday night, Rosewater game night. I mean, we do play games together, but uh, my son and I play magic from time to time. That's, that's most of my magic outside of work is playing with my son. Um, I get to play a lot at work. I mean, maybe if my job wasn't making magic and not playing magic all the time, I would, I would carve more time out for magic. But because I, I get to play a lot of magic at work, I don't actually play tons outside. So I, I love when I get to play with picture, real pictures and stuff. That is like a special treat for me. I always try to carve out a little time to play Commander on Friday afternoons. So I play a little more with real magic cards than Mark does. But I would say probably 80% of my magic play is with playtest stickers. OK, next question. Um, I was wondering, when you do play magic, is there a certain deck that you like to use? Oh, well. One of the things that I try to do as a designer is I want to understand all sorts of different kinds of players. And so I really try to mix up my decks just to play a lot of different kinds of decks. But um, when left to my own devices, usually every block, there's one, one strategy that I'm just real fond of. And so, like, for example, in Scars of Mirrodin, it took me 14 years to get Poison back in the game. So I was very excited to have Poison. So I. I played a lot of Poison because I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, and so usually there's something. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a bunch of cards. And Kaladesh is a very build-around set, a lot of cool things. So I've been having some fun doing some of that, I'm just building around really weird cards, doing fun things. So, so I usually like to play a blue-green deck. But uh, my favorite deck right now is a mono green commander deck led by Reki, the history of Kamigawa. So it's just every green legendary creature I could find piled into the deck. And I just keep drawing more cards and playing more legendary creatures until I overwhelm my opponents with big creatures. Is Safi in the deck? No, no, she's uh, green white. She won't oh, go in the deck. Oh, she's green white. OK. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot she was green white. Okay. Hey guys, I got Jenny at Jenny Sharp would like to know, okay. what is your favorite card in Kaladesh? Oh, this is easy. Okay, so one day, um, Sean and I were talking. Sean Main and I were the co-leads for this set. And Sean said, I think we're a little bit low on just weird artifacts. Just, just people in an artifact block wanted to have just strange artifacts to build around. We need some. Mark, could you, could you make some? And so I went off, and I, I did a bunch of designs, and they were all called, like, Whatchamacallit and Thingamabob. But one of them, for those who don't know, I love doubling things. I love doubling things. So I made a little artifact that doubled Enter the Battlefield Triggers that you guys now know as Penharmicon. Um, that is my favorite card. Um, I, I think it's called Whatchamacallit in design. And anyway, I, I love wacky build-around means, and I love doubling. So 
It's like all in one tight package. So for those who don't know, what it does is it just takes every enter the battlefield trigger of your permanents and it just doubles them for free. So. I would have to say that my favorite is the Sky Sovereign, which is the console flagship. It's a gigantic vehicle that uh, just looks super impressive. It's this enormous flying ship, and it's just beautiful. So I was a, an early champion of the vehicle mechanic, and I'm so happy that it uh, finally made it into print. OK. Right, next one's coming from over, over here. here. Where's hey okay. Over the past few years, we've seen story get a lot more focus on the cards. How does mm -hmm. that change the design process? Do you get like beats ahead of time you need to work in, or is that more organic? Well, so here, yeah, here's the biggest change. Once upon a time, I would, I and my team would start work before we knew what the story was. So, for example, when I did, um, what was the set that had uh, Ashiak in it? Uh, Theros. Theros. When I did Theros. I had this early story with like Dark Jace and he was a nightmare person and like I, I made my own little story up. Like I knew eventually they'd have a real story and I kind of made up my own version of it. And then they would come along and then they would sort of make a real story. Um, but now when we start, I actually know what the story is before I begin. Like when I sat down um, to do Kaladesh, I had a much better idea um, what was going on. Like it wasn't, oh, what's going to happen here? No, I had a much better idea of what was going to happen. And because of that, we can, like, one of the goals is, when we talk about flavor, I think people think about the art, the names, the flavor text. But as far as I'm concerned, the mechanics are as much flavor as anything else. That if you want people to really feel the world, not only does it need to look a certain way, it needs to feel a certain way when you play. And so we now start knowing it. Like, this, for example, has a much more optimistic tone. We knew that going in. We knew what kind of world it was and what kind of feeling we wanted. And so that is a huge help. And so you will see we are working very closely with the creative team. Like we want the worlds and the story to all be, it, it's, not, it's not like there's, there's gameplay and there's story and they're separate animals. We really want them interlinked. Yeah, I do feel like we're in a sort of new age of design here. Um, for me personally, working on Oath of the Gatewatch, it felt like the story was supposed to be about the Planeswalkers teaming up and forming a team, and so I tried to incorporate that into some of the mechanics of the set. So you have mechanics like support and surge that sort of reward you for teaming up or reward your creatures for teaming up. Okay, next question. Hello. Have you guys had a card that you were super excited for during development but wasn't well recepted by the community? And inversely, have you ever designed a card you thought was boring or uninteresting that became a smash hit? Um, well, I mean, one of the things to remember is design doesn't set power level. So like, I just make what, you know, we make what we think are fun cards, and then development later figures out whether or not they want to push them. So I don't really anticipate things being strong or not strong just because that's not my area. Um, but for example, um, if you go back to Ravnica, like every once in a while, I, I do what I call uh, sort of a selfish card, which is, Look, I make the game of magic. Every once in a while, I'm allowed to make a card that just I really want to exist. And you know, most of what I do is I'm making cards for lots of different kinds of players, but I'm a kind of player, so every once in a while I make a card for me. And in Ravnica, I made a card, really, I had nobody else in mind. I just wanted to make something that I loved that was something that just I knew I would have fun with. So that card was doubling season. <laughs> um, and I mean, a lot of people shared my love of doubling things, and so, I, I didn't necessarily expect that card to be like as popular as it was because I that wasn't my mindset. I just was making what I like literally what I would have loved to play. Um, and so there's a lot of that sometimes where we make cards and like I don't know who the audience for a card is going to be. We just make kind of cool cards and cards can take off. Cards that we don't anticipate, you know, oh th this is just a fun whatever, and then like nor in the wary. I made Norn the Wary because I loved his flavor text. And I was, I, I was trying to capture Norn the Wary. If you told me one day there'd be a format where like, people were making decks built around him, I would not have anticipated that. But you know, it, was just, it was made because I wanted to make something very flavorful and match the character. Sometimes we'll just make cards that are very bread and butter and straightforward, and then the creative team will do something offbeat and unexpected that just catapults it into popularity, you know, like Totally Lost from Return to Ravnica was just a very normal limited card. I don't even remember what it does, minus to the power no, no, or something. Puts creature on top of a library, I think. Yeah, and so, 
a very generic effect that you can see in lots of magic sets, but then the creative team and the artist that drew the card made this character that became, you know, Fibblethip, this homunculus that is a beloved character now. And so this, this card has become very popular through nothing that we did. It was all about the creative team making the card that much better. Yeah, when I saw the art for Savage Punch, my first reaction is, <laughs> is it too late to make a legendary bear of that bear? <laughs> and I was like, yes, it's too late. Like, oh, I, if I'd known, I would have done that. I, so. Awesome, oh, thank you guys. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, next question. Oh, oh Chandra. Chandra. <laughs> it's good to see you again. <laughs> I have a question from Zachary Johnson at Fleece Main Lion, and he would like to know, how do you know a mechanic is a keeper? And will there be a time where no design space is able to be explored? Yeah, so design space is not infinite. There is finite design space. Luckily, it's a decent, you know, so it's, it's fairly large. I, I don't expect to run out anytime soon. Um, how do we tell when mechanic is good? You play it. I mean, literally, you can think about it all you want. The way you tell whether something works or not is you actually put it in a deck, you shuffle it up, and you play it. And when you play it, are you smiling? Are you, like, <laughs> is it fun? I mean, that's really how we figure out whether something is a keeper is, is it enjoyable to play? And there's mechanics that seem interesting, and then when you play them, they are not. You don't smile when you play them. And that, that, that really is the major determiner, is, is something fun? Yeah, during the process, there are sort of various points where you're checking, like, is it going to make it past this gate, or are we going to kill this mechanic? The first one is, is it fun? The second one is frequently, can we design enough cards? If we're sitting there designing cards, we d and then we do the first three, and it seems fine, then we get to number four, and we're like, what's the fourth card with this mechanic supposed to look like? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm out of ideas. There's nothing else that fits. That can be a big indicator that there's not enough design space within that mechanic, and that you need to either find a way to expand the mechanic or look elsewhere. The other thing to keep in mind is there's lots of gates. Can the mechanic be developmentally done? Can you balance it? Can it be templated? Does it work in the rules? Is there a creative spin that makes sense? Can it be work, does it work on digital? Like there's all sorts of things we have to figure out of whether something can work. So there's a lot of reasons the mechanic gets killed along the way. But it, to me, it all boils down to mostly, right, is it fun? Do you want to play it? OK, next question. Hi. Um, on the cards, uh, live fast and die young, mm -hmm. um, I, they were very like mechanically black, but then the flavor of it is like a very different side of what we see on black cards. I'm wondering if uh, we'll be seeing that more as we uh, go along in Caradesh spoilers. Yeah, so one of the thing is, when they were trying to figure out what would be the key race in black, they really didn't want to do undead, so zombies were out. Vampires didn't really make sense as a major race, so they came up with the Aetherborn. And they really, one of the things that's great about the color wheel, that I mean, I love the color wheel, um, <laughs> is there are a lot of facets to things. I know it's really easy to take the most simplistic version of the color and go, hey, this color is just about this thing. And yes, black seeks power, for example, but that, that's not all of black. Uh, and the Aetherborn are very interesting, like, here's a race that doesn't live very long. You know, that they, their, their creation of the output of ether, and like, they live for a very short time. Well, what would, what would your philosophy be like if you knew you only live for a tiny amount of time? And so, they have a very sort of embraced life in a way that is interestingly black, but not the traditional way that you see things. And that, I know the creative team loves finding pockets like that. They love finding, hey, is there a different way to do it? Um, and one of the things we do in all the worlds we do now, uh, an exercise that we do, is when we start doing exploratory design, the creative team does what's called exploratory world building. And what we do is we say, take all the five colors in this world, what is the most defining quality of that color, not in magic as a whole, but in this world? And if you saw the um, world, they showed that at the world building panel. You guys, it's online, so you guys can look at it. They talked about, you know, each color on Kaladesh, what is that color about? And I think that's really interesting and, and definitely, uh, that's one of the neat things about magic is that it's so deep that you can explore different facets, facets of it. I really enjoy that. Yeah, I think the Aetherborn are great. They're not these evil, corrupt entities. They are 
but they are the sort of consumers of this society. They're the ones that everybody make things, makes things for. They're the ones that want to experience life to the fullest, and they want to be rich and they want to live in luxury because they don't have much time left. Okay, next question. Great, we're going to take another one from the internet here. Okay. At the Saber Vault would like to know that after so many years in R&D, what are the challenges that you confront now versus the early years? Um, so one of the ways I think about it, well, I'll make a metaphor, which is let's talk about you're building cars. You know, making the Model T was a very different animal from making modern cars. And that I think when you look back at the early days, one of the interesting things was, you know, we're 23 years into the game right now. We've learned a lot. Like one of the reasons I think magic design is so strong is we've gotten to iterate on it for 23 years, you know, and that I look back at the early days, you know, when I started, for example, and like, for example, in um, Tempest, we, what's the common spell that costs two red that does damage? Rolling Thunder. I made Rolling Thunder so that the common red direct damage spell had two red in it so you couldn't splash it. Like that was a big innovation. Like instead of, you know, Caravex Torch that required one red, our common red X spell only required two red. And that seems quaint looking back, but like that was an advancement, you know, and that we made little advancements at the time and that each of those advancements we then built upon. And so there's a famous saying about if I can see farther, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, like we keep learning things and that modern design owes a lot to all the lessons along the way. And so when I look back at old sets, you know, there were a lot of things we didn't know that we had to learn. There's a lot of mistakes that we made, but from that we grew. And so how is design now? It's completely different. You know, we have exploratory design, exploratory world building. We, you know, the story is known before we start. Uh, you know, there's all these things that we do. We have more block planning of knowing where, what comes before and what comes after. There's all the stuff we do that we didn't even touch before. Like when I first started, we would start a design going, what are the two mechanics? That's where we started. That, that's literally how we started. What are the two mechanics? And we'd start from there. You know, flanking and phasing sounds good. Let's make a set, you know. Um, and so it's just a world of difference. Yeah, and th that progress continues to this day. We are always critical of what we've done and how we can improve going forward. So I feel like the sets that are in the pipeline right now are better than the ones that you've just seen and because we've learned a lot of those lessons already and are already starting to apply them. So it's really great to just be continually iterating our process and continually improving how we make magic sets. Okay, next question. Uh, so recently we had some WOTC employees go around the local uh, area and ask questions about the state of the game. Mm -hmm. So as a player, I want to know from a developer standpoint, how do you guys feel about the state of the game? Well, I, I write an article every year called The State of Design where I talk about where I think things are at. Um, we just made a big change. In fact, one of the biggest changes we've ever made in Magic, going from the three-block world to the two-block world. Um, and that was, I, you never realize how hard something is until you actually have to do it. That was really hard. And I think, I mean, personally speaking, Battle for Zendikar does not live up to my standard of what I want to do as a designer in that I feel like I made more mistakes than I normally do. Um, part of that was literally in the middle of the set, we changed how we made magic, you know. Um, but I really feel that like Kaladesh is us getting our, I mean, Shadows was definitely the first step, but Kaladesh is on our A game. Like Kaladesh is really, I mean, everybody working on it just did amazing work. And I, I am so proud of Kaladesh. Like it might be the best set I've ever done. I mean, Innistrad is, is still fighting, for, has that honor right now. But it is, I feel like it took us a little while to get our bearings straight because whenever you change things, it's hard. But I, I think we are doing so many things that we've not done before, and we're doing them all together, and I'm really excited. Like, I work, I live in the future. Like, I, I handed Kaladash off, you know, a year and a half ago, and I've been working on things in the future, and I'm really, really excited because, like, as, as Ethan sort of teased, we keep getting better at it, we keep doing really cool things, and that, like, my goal is every time we announce a new set, I want you guys to be excited and go, how can they keep exciting us? You know, that's the goal, to constantly excite you. And I, I'm really, really proud of what we're doing. I'm really proud of what's coming. 
you know, the game definitely, we're trying to find our feet. We made a major change in a couple different ways. We changed how we make design, we changed how we do development, we changed our standard work, we changed how we're telling the story. We did a lot of changes all at once, but I feel that we're finding our feet and we're doing some really good work which you guys are going to love. Okay, next question. So I was wondering if you were ever going to give consideration to making another unset. Oh, an unset. Okay, well, here, here's my, <laughs> I get this question a lot. Um, my hope is that as things like conspiracy do well, that we can, like, here's what, here's what needs to happen for another unset. The powers that be have to believe that enough people want it that they would buy it. That really comes down to um, the early unsets, we overprinted them some, and so there is this belief that, oh, maybe the audience isn't there. I know the audience is there. I know the audience wants it. I, I have file cabinets of design. Like, it, once we convince people to make it, I, trust me, I will make an awesome, awesome set. The step is convincing the people that there's an audience. So if you love the unsets, if you want to see more, not just me, uh, don't preach to the choir, communicate to other, other venues and watch it that you want to see it. You know, I, the, the success of conspiracy only says to me, of course there's an audience, of course there is. We just have to communicate that. But I, I promise you this, it will, I believe it will happen. I, I believe it's not uh, an if it will happen, I believe it's when it will happen. But the more people can convey how much you want it, the sooner it will happen. So I, I'm there for you, I want it to happen. The second I'm, I'm told that it can happen, I have awesome, awesome ideas, and it will be an amazing set. Thank you. Hey, I'm back. Yeah. Um, so this is an art question. So yeah. uh, I, I don't know if you can answer, but I'll throw okay. it to you anyway. Uh, I, so the art in Kaladesh is really interesting. Obviously, it, it has some historical background, and it has a, a steampunk theme. Mm -hmm. But it's also definitely very much its own theme. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious what the the sort of the seed of that was? Was it like a particular artist went off and came up with this neat idea? Or was it a, a grinding thing where people no, work on so, it a while? So here's where it started. People have asked us to do steampunk for many, many years. It's one of a common request. Um, and we also knew that we were coming off two very dark blocks. And so what we wanted was, we wanted something that was bright and optimistic. And the creative team said, is there a way to do bright and optimistic with steampunk? Because traditionally speaking, steampunk's a little more pessimistic. If you actually look at steampunk, it's a little dirtier, it's a little, you know, it, it's, it's not science as a thing of wonder. A lot of times steampunk takes science as, you know, causing problems. And so the creative team said, could we do steampunk in a way that is optimistic and just go in a different way? And I think that was the kernel that they were following, which is how do we do bright, sunny steampunk? Um, and as Jeremy Jarvis likes to quote, magic steampunk ended up having not a lot of steam and not a lot of punk. Um, and we, we've been referring to it as ether punk. But I mean, I think we really put our own mark on it is, I love this world where technology is art. I think that's amazing. You know, I think it's a, it, and the more as you get to explore it, I mean, and you guys have just, just seen the first glimpses of it, it is a beautiful, beautiful set. And I love, I love where we got to. I think we got to it, and this happens a lot in Magic, by pushing the pendulum in a different direction than where we were. And I, so I think the optimism and the sunniness was, look, we have the Eldrazi, we got Innisrod, like, let's, let's have a happy world. And I think that's how we got there. I do think that Jeremy, as the senior art director, sort of started with the seed of an idea, just like we start with you know, one, one individual thing and build off of that. He had these uh, jewelry designs that he had seen, and his challenge was like, how can I figure out how to turn these beautiful pieces of jewelry into a gear, and then turn that gear into an entire technological aesthetic for a world? And so it's just kind of amazing to me how you start so small and just build up from it into an entire world that way. OK, guys, I'm sad to say our time is up. So I want to thank everybody who were able to ask questions and everybody at home and here in the live audience. Thank you so much. So definitely stay tuned. We got some more fun stuff coming. We got the uh, Spellcaster Showdown coming. So uh, stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. So thank you guys very much. Thank you.